Hello and welcome back to my channel students. So this is Tulika Sen Gupta and you are listening Easy Audio Book. So today I will be reading The Adventure written by Jayanth Narlika and from your book Hornbill Class 11. The Jija Mata Express sped along the Pune-Bombay route considerably faster than the Deccan Queen. There were no industrial townships outside Pune. The first stop, Lunavala, came in 40 minutes. The ghat section that followed was no different from what he knew. The train stopped at Karjat only briefly and went on at even greater speed. It roared through Kalyan. Meanwhile, the racing mind of Professor Gaitande had arrived at a plan of action in Bombay. Indeed, a historian, he felt he should have thought of it sooner. He would go to a big library and browse through history books. That was the surest way of finding out how the present state of affairs was reached. He also planned eventually to return to Pune and have a long talk with Rajendra Deshpande, who would surely help him understand what had happened. That is, assuming that in this world there existed someone called Rajendra Deshpande. The train, the train stopped beyond the long tunnel. It was a small station called Sarhad. An Anglo-Indian in uniform went through the train checking permits. This is where the British Raj begins. You are going for the first time, I presume? Khan Sahib asked. Yes, the reply was factually correct. Gandhar Pant had not been to the Bombay before. He ventured a question. And Khan Sahib, how will you go to the Peshawar? This train goes to the Victoria Terminus. I will take the frontier mail tonight out of the central. How far does it go? By what route? Bombay to Delhi, then to Lahore and then to Peshawar. A long journey. I will reach Peshawar the day after tomorrow. Thereafter, Khan Sahib spoke a lot about his business and Kandhar Pant was willing listener. For in that way, he was able to get some flavor of life in this India that was so different. The train now passed through the su suburban rail traffic. The blue carriages carried the letter GPMR on the side. Greater Bombay Metropolitan Railway, explained Khan Sahib. See the tiny uh, Union Jack painted on each carriage? A gentle reminder that we are in British territory. The train began to slow down beyond Dadar and stopped only at its destination, Victoria Terminus. The station looked remarkably neat and clean. The staff was mostly made up of Anglo-Indians and Perseus along with a handful of British officers. As he emerged from the station, Kandhar Pant found himself facing an imposing building. The letter on it proclaimed its identity to those who did not know this Bombay landmark, East India House headquarters of the East India Company. Prepared as he was for many shocks, Professor Gaitonde had not expected this. The East India Company had been wound up shortly after the event of 1857 at least. That is what history books said. Yet, here it was, not only alive but flourishing. So, history had taken a different turn, perhaps before 1857. How and when had it happened? He had to find out. As he walked along Hornby Road, as it was called, he found a different set of shops and office buildings. There was no handloom house building. Instead, there were booths and Woolworth departmental stores imposing office of Lloyd's, Barclays and other British banks as in typical high street of a town in England. He said to the English receptionist, she searched through the telephone list, the staff list, and then through the directory of employees of all the branches of the firm. 
she shook her head and said i'm afraid i can't find any one of that name either here or in any of our branches are you sure he worked there this was a blow not totally unexpected if he himself were dead in this world what guarantee had he that his son would be alive indeed he may not even have been born he thanked the girl politely and came out it was characteristic of him not to worry about where he would stay his man his main concern was to make his way to the library of the asiatic society to solve the riddle of riches grabbing a quick lunch at restaurant he made his way to the town hall yes to his relief the town hall was there and it did house the library he entered the reading room and asked for a list of history books including his own his five volumes duly arrived on his table he started from ashoka volume 2 up to samudra gupta volume 3 up to mohammad ghori and volume 4 up to the death of aurangzeb up to this period history was as he knew it the change evidently had occurred in the last volume reading volume 5 with both ends inward gandhar pant finally conversed on the precise moment where history had taken a different turn a page in the book described the battle of panipat and it mentioned that the marathas won it handsomely abdali was routed and he was chased back to kabul by the triumphant maratha army led by sadashiv rao bhau and his nephew the young vishwas rao the book did not go into blow by blow account of the battle itself rather it elaborated in details its consequences for the power struggle in india bandhar pant read through the account avidly the style of writing was unmistakably his yet he was reading the account for the first time their victory in the battle was not only a great moral booster to the marathas but it also established their supremacy in north india the east india company which had been watching these developments from the sideline got the message and temporarily shelved its expansionist program for the peshwas the immediate result was an increase in the influence of bhau sahib and vishwas rao who eventually eventually succeeded his father in 1780 ad the trouble maker dada sahib was relegated to the background and he eventually retired from state politics to its dismay the east india company met its match in the new maratha ruler vishwas rao he and his brother madhav rao combined political acumen with valor and systematically expanded their influence all over india the company was reduced to pockets for influence near bombay kolkata and madras just like its european rivals the portuguese and the french for political reason the peshwas kept the puppet mughal regime alive in delhi in the 19th century these de facto rulers from pune were astute enough to recognize the importance of the technological age drowning in bureau they set up their own centers for science and technology here the east india company saw another opportunity to extend its influence it offered aid and exports they were expected only to make the local centers self sufficient the 12th century brought about further changes inspired by the west india moved toward a democracy by then the peshwas had lost their enterprises and they were gradually replaced by democratically elected bodies the sultanate at delhi survived even this transition largely because it wielded no real influence the shahanshah of delhi was no more than a figurehead to rubber stamp the recommendations made by the central parliament as he heard on gandhar pant began to appreciate the india he had seen it was a country that had not been subjected to slavery for the white man it had learned 
to stand on its feet and knew what self-respect was. From a position of strength and for purely commercial reasons, it had allowed the British to retain Bombay as the sole outpost of the subcontinent. Here, in the year 2001, according to the Treaty of 1908, Gandharpan could not help comparing the country he knew with what he was witnessing around him. But at the same time, he felt that his investigations were incomplete. How did the Marathas win the battle? To find the answer, he must look for accounts of the battle itself. He went through the books and journals before him. At last, among the books, he found one that gave him the clue. It was Bhau Shaheb Panchi Pakhar. Although he seldom relied on the Pakhar for historical evidence, he found them entertaining to read, sometimes buried in, a, in the graphic but doctored accounts. He could spot the germ of death. He found one now in three line account of how close Vishwas Rao had come to be being killed. And then Vishwas Rao guided his horse to the melee where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them. And God was merciful. A short bruise passed his ear. But in the difference of a till, the season would have led to his death. At 8 o'clock, the librarian politely reminded the professor that the library was closing for the day. Gandharpan emerged from his thoughts. Looking around, he noticed that he was the only reader left in that magnificent hall. I beg your pardon, sir. May I request you to keep these books here for my use tomorrow morning? By the way, when do you open? At 8 o'clock, sir. The librarian smiled. Here was a user and researcher right after his thoughts. As the professor left the table, he shoved some notes into his right pocket. Absent mindedly, he also shoved the parker into his left pocket. He found a guest house to stay in and had a frugal meal. He then sat, set out for a stroll toward the Azad Maidan. In the Madan, he found a throng moving toward a pandal. So, a lecture was to take place. Force of habit took Professor Gaitonde towards the pandal. The lecture was in progress, although people kept coming and going. But Professor Gaitonde was not looking at the audience. He was staring at the platform as if mesmerized. There was a table and a chair, but the latter was unoccupied, the presidential chair unoccupied. The sight stirred him to the depth, like a piece of iron extracted to a magnet. He swiftly moved toward the chair. The speaker stopped in mid-sentence. To shock, too shocked to continue, but the audience soon found voice. Back at the chair, this lecture series has no chairperson. Away from the platform, mister, the chair is symbol. Don't you know? What nonsense! Who ever heard of a public lecture without a president signatory? Professor Gaitonde went to the mic and gave vent to his views. Ladies and gentlemen, an unchaired lecture is like Shakespeare's Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Let me tell you, but the audience was in no mood to listen. Tell us nothing. We are sick of remarks from the chair, of vote of thanks, of long introductions. We only want to listen to the speaker. We abolished the old customs long ago. Keep the platform empty, please. But Gandharpan had the experience of speaking at 999 meetings and had faced the Pune audience at its most hostile. He kept on talking. He soon became a target for a shower of tomatoes, eggs and other objects. But he kept on trying valiantly to correct this sacrilege. Finally, the audience swarmed to the stage to eject him bodily. And in crowds, 
in the crowd ka dharpant was nowhere to be seen that is all i have to tell rajendra all i know is that i was found in the azad maidan in the morning but i was back in the world i'm familiar with now where exactly did i spend those two days when i was absent from here rajendra was dumbfounded dumbfounded by the narrative it took him a while to reply professor before just prior to your collision with the truck what were you doing rajendra asked i was thinking of the catastrophe theory and its implications of history right i thought so rajendra smiled don't smile smartly in case you think that it was just my mind playing tricks and my imagination running amok look at this and triumph triumphantly professor gaitonde produced his vital piece of evidence a page torn out of a book rajendra read the text on the printed page and his face underwent a change gone was the smile and in its place came a grave expression he was visibly moved gandhar pant pressed home his advantage i had inadvertently slipped the pakhar in my pocket as i left the library i discovered my error when i was paying for my meal i had intended to return it next morning but it seems that in the mile of azad maidan the book was lost only the torn off page remained and luckily for me the page contains vital evidence rajendra again read read the page and described how vishwasrao narrowly missed the bullet and how that event taken as an omen by the maratha army turned the tide in their favor now look at this kandhar pant produced his own copy of bhav saheb banchi bakar opened at the relevant page the account ran thus and then vishwasrao guided his horse to the mela mele where the elite troops were fighting and he attacked them and god expressed his displeasure he was hit by the bullet professor gaitonde you have given me food for thought until i saw this material evidence i had simply put your experience down to fantasy but facts can be stranger than fantasies as i am beginning to realize facts what are the facts i'm dying to know professor gaitonde said rajendra mentioned him to silently and started pacing the room obviously under great mental strain finally he turned around and said professor gaitonde i will try to rationalize your experience on the basis of two scientific theories as known today whether i succeed or not in convincing you of the fact only you can judge for you have indeed passed through a fantastic experience or more correctly a catastrophic experience please continue rajendra i'm all ears professor gaitan de replied rajendra continued pacing as he talked you have heard a lot about the cat- catastrophe theory at that seminar let us apply it to the battle of panipat wars fought face to face on open grounds offer excellent example of this theory the maratha army was facing abdali's troops on the field of panipat there was no great disparity between the latter's troops and the opposing forces the armor was comparably comparable so a lot dependent on the leadership and the morale of the troops the juncture at which vishwasrao the son and heir of uh, to the peshwa was killed proved to be turning point as history has it his uncle bhav saheb rushed into the mile and was never seen again whether he was killed in battle or survived is now ne- is not known but for the troops at that particular moment the blue of losing their leader was crucial they lost their morale and fighting spirit they there followed an utter rout exactly professor and what you have 
shown me on that torn page is the course taken by the battle when the bullet missed Vishwas Rao, a crucial event gone the other way, and its effect on the troops was also the opposite. It boosted their morale and provided just that extra impetus that made all the differences, Rajendra said. Maybe so. Similar statements are made about the Battle of Waterloo, which Napoleon could have won, but we live in a unique world which has a unique history. This idea of it might have been is okay for the sake of speculation, but not for reality, Gandharpan said. Big issues with you there. In fact, that brings me to my second point, which you may find strange, but please hear me out, Rajendra, Rajendra said. Gandharpan listened expectantly as Rajendra continued. What do we mean by reality? We experience is it directly with our senses or indirectly via instruments. But is it limited to what we see? Does it have other manifestations? That reality may not be unique has been founded from experiments and on very small systems of atoms and their constituent particles. When dealing with such symptoms, the physicist discovered something startling. The behavior of these system cannot be predicated definitely even if all the physical laws governing those systems are unknown. Take an example. I fire an electron from a source. Where will it go? If I fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed, I know where it will be at a later time. But I cannot make such an assertion for the electron. It may be here, there, anywhere. I can at best quote odds for it being found in a specified location at a specified time. The lack of determinism in quantum theory. Even an ignoramus historian like me has said has heard of it, Professor Guy Tonde said. So imagine many world pictures. In one world, the electron is found here. In another, it is over there. In yet another, it is in a still different location. Once the observer finds where it is, we know which world we are talking about. But all those alternative worlds could exist just the same. Rajendra paused to marshal his thoughts. But is there any contact between those many worlds? Professor Kaitonde asked. Yes and no. Imagine two worlds. For example, in both an electron is orbiting the nucleus of an atom, like planets around the sun, Gandharpan interjected. Not quite. You know the precise trajectory of the planet? The electron could be orbiting in any of large number of specified states. These states may be used to identify the world. In state number one, we have the electron in a state of higher energy. In state number two, it is in a state of lower energy. It can make a jump from high to low energy and send out a pulse of radiation. Or a pulse of radiation can knock it out of state number two into state number one. Such transitions are common in microscopic systems. What if it happened on a microscopic level? Rajendra said. I get you. You are suggesting that I made a transition from one world to another and back again. Gandharpant asked. Fantastic. Though it seems this is the only explanation I can offer. My theory is that catastrophic situation offer radically different alternatives for the world to proceed. It seems that so far as reality is concerned, all alternatives are viable, but the observer can experience only one of them at, at a time. But making a transition, you are able to experience two worlds, although one at a time. The one you live in now and the one where you spend two days. One has the history we know, the other a different history. 
The separation of bifurcation took place in the Battle of Panipat. We neither travelled to the past nor to the future. We were the present but experiencing a different world. Of course, by the same token, there must be many more different worlds arising. But of bifurcations at different points of time. As Rajendra con concluded, Kandharpant asked the question that was beginning to bother him more. But why did I make the transition? If I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Unfortunately, there are many unsolved questions in science and this is one of them. But that does not stop me from guessing. Rajendra smiled and proceeded. We need some interaction to cause a transition. Perhaps at the time of the collision, you were thinking about the catastrophe theory and its role in war. Maybe you were wondering about the Battle of Panipat. Perhaps the neurons in your brain acted as a trigger. A good guess. I was indeed wondering what course history would have taken if the result of the battle had gone the other way. Professor Gaitande said, that that was going to be the topic of my thousandth presidential address. Now you are in the happy position of recounting your real life experiences rather than just speculating. Rajendra laughed. But Gandhar Pant was grave. No, Rajendra, my thousandth address was met on the Azad Maidan. When I was so rudely interrupted. No, the Professor Gaitonde, who disappeared while defending his chair on the platform, will now never be seen. Presiding at another meeting, I have conveyed my regrets to the organizer of the Panipat seminar. So, this was all about this chapter. If you like my narration or the narrating style, please do like, share, and subscribe my video. At the same time, don't forget to hit the bell icon. That's all for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.